1992, 25-year-old Stephanie Slater was kidnapped and locked inside a coffin for eight torturous days. Her attacker, Michael Sams, had already killed before. If Stephanie's employers didn't give in to his demands and release thousands of pounds, she would be murdered, making this a crime that shook Britain. few minutes you'll hear the voice of the man who kidnapped Stephanie Slater. It's the voice of someone who may well have been involved in other major crimes of course, including murder. He had the knife at my throat, he's over me, he's panting and he just says if you move again I'll slit your throat. The ransom money was dropped near the village of Oxpring in the Barnsley area of Yorkshire. The kidnapper escaped with the money. This man had also committed a murder in the past, we potentially have got a situation where one Stephanie's life was in grave danger. He said, the only way your phone slides is when she's dead. If you ain't got her back in 24 hours, that's it. Stephanie Slater was an intelligent young estate agent. She had a whole life ahead of her. But on the 22nd of January 1992, this all changed. Michael Sams kidnapped Stephanie at knife point and held a company to ransom. He wanted £175,000 in return for her life. This film will tell the story of Stephanie Slater through the eyewitness accounts of the people at the centre of the kidnap. Wednesday morning. Stephanie has been with Birmingham estate agent Shipways for just six weeks. Today, she has an appointment in the diary arranged by letter last week. People would just normally phone up to book an appointment. You take their details over the phone and then you go to the appointment when you'd arranged the time to do that. But with this, it was a letter. There was no phone confirmation whatsoever. So the day in question on the Wednesday morning, um, myself and Jane, the other girl, looked through the diary and I said, look, I tell you what, Jane, I'll do this appointment because he hasn't confirmed. So he probably isn't going to be there. So you go with Kevin on that valuation and I'll do this. Stephanie deals with other inquiries before rushing to the viewing two minutes away on Turnbury Road. I just said, Mr. Southall, he said yes. And I said, oh, I'm sorry I'm a bit late. He didn't say anything. The house has been vacant for some time. The man shows some interest before being shown upstairs. It was a normal house viewing. I've done hundreds and hundreds in my time. Um, to hurry up the viewing because I had the feeling that he wasn't interested in the house. So I said, do you want to go upstairs, have a look up there? I think he said something about, is that double glazed, referring to the side window? Um, which I said, yes it was, because all of the upstairs, I believe, um, was, was double glazed, especially, well, the bathroom definitely was. An unsuspecting Stephanie allows the man a cursory look around the top floor while she waits in one of the bedrooms. But what is about to happen will change her life forever. This moment in time he was looking around the house, I didn't think he was that interested, so I just walked off into one of the rooms. Because it's early in the morning, you want to get back to the warm office and your cup of coffee, and, and sometimes that's how it is, you know, you don't want to be in a a freezing cold house and I don't know sometimes you get a bit complacent so I walked past him and started to walk down the stairs it was at this point he suddenly took an interest he said what's that up there so in order to answer his question I have to walk past him to see what he's actually pointing at and it was just a hook on the wall I said what this this is just for a, a a flannel or a towel to be hung on and he didn't answer me which I found strange because he'd asked a question so as I turned around he just suddenly changed all I can remember was him he seemed to grow bigger huge he seemed to be flying through the air at me his face was all contorted it takes a couple of seconds for your brain to register that this is danger and it was absolute and total sheer 
terror because you realize now oh my god that's the only thing that goes through your head is oh my god he pulled his hands up in front of him and he got flashes of silver coming out of his hands the flashes of silver were weapons one was a knife the other was a, a flat chisel with a hook on the end of it horrible things I just thought I've got to get past him I've got to get round him I've got to get out of here now he's shouting at me he's screaming at me he's got the weapons in my face he's trying to overpower me I'm in this fight with this grubby little man you know this doesn't happen surely to God and I, I just thought he was going to cut me um, or rape me there was nothing to pick up to help myself to to attack him back with there was nothing to defend myself with I got nothing on me apart from a key my face was getting nicked with the knife bits of my hair were coming off because he was cutting it with the knife I reached out for the weapons I grabbed them and we were fighting over them now because I wouldn't let go and I bent the chisel I thought well that's one I've got rid of and I don't know what happened to it it was useless to him but the other knife I've still got in my hand and he's saying let it go let it, and I won't you see because that's what is going to hurt me with what I've got here is what could kill me I'm not letting it go and I didn't I held on to it and then of course to get it back he pulled it hard down through my hand I looked down at my hand and he then jumped on me and he grabbed my hair from behind and twisted it round so he wrenched my head back and then he pushed me over the side of the bath and he was going go on get your legs in get your legs in and I can just remember looking up at this mirror and in this mirror I could see my face and my neck and the knife sticking right here he's above me holding the knife to my throat saying I'm gonna slit your throat I'm gonna cut your throat if you start screaming Wednesday 22nd of January 15 minutes ago Stephanie Slater was confronted in a frenzied attack what she thought was a normal viewing of a property has now turned into a struggle to save her life. And I said, all right, you've got me. All right, you've got me. Don't harm me. Please remember I'm human. And that, that, that did seem to work. Stephanie is overpowered and forced downstairs at knife point. I thought he was going to tie me up and in that house he was going to rape me. Um, then he tied a noose around my neck so then I thought no he's gonna hang me and then he said where are your keys and I said what keys he said the car keys and I thought oh, he wants the car he wants the he can have the bloody car so I said I left them down downstairs on the cabinet in the entrance hall and so now he's walking me down the stairs one step at a time holding me by this rope that's at the back of my neck because the rope I thought he was going to hang me from, he wants it as a dog leash, so I, I can't run off. And he's got the knife sticking into my back, and he's walking me down the steps one step at a time we get to the bottom. And I realise it isn't the key he wants. It's me. And so I said, the keys are in my pocket. Despite Stephanie's cry for help, nobody comes to the rescue. This was the worst time for me because I'm, I'm sitting on the stairs, I can look up in front of me and I've left the front door open like you always should. And as I went to push down on my legs to quickly leave myself up to get me out that front door, it was like I didn't have legs from the knees down, it was like they weren't there. I'd gone into shock so much I couldn't even feel my lower legs. By now, he's blindfolded me anyway, and I'm thinking, that's it. You've just signed your own death warrant. The petrified and vulnerable estate agent is now forced from the house with a knife to her side and led to the attacker's waiting car. Stephanie now vanishes from Birmingham without a trace. Unbeknown to Stephanie, she is being driven over 70 miles northeast to Newark. Although blindfolded, she tries to take in details of the journey. You know, the timings, how long she'd stopped. She recalled at one stage from stopping it, then she heard trains going by. You know, did she have the sun in her face? Was it on this side, that side? So all this information is being pulled together. 
As Stephanie slips further away, concerned colleagues are now aware she hasn't returned to the office. Kevin and the other girl in the office, Jane, they actually drove past Turnbury Road and my car was still outside and they commented to each other that, oh, she's been there a long time, hope she's okay. And as her boss and colleagues now grow increasingly worried, the attacker's car grinds to a halt and the journey takes an unusual twist. He stopped the car, we were somewhere quiet away from traffic, and he kind of half sat me up, uh, said no screaming, I have the knife, and he took down the gag. And he said, I don't know whether you realise, but you've been kidnapped. I almost laughed because I thought, well, my family's got no money. You've got the wrong person here, you know. And then he said, I'm going to be asking shipways for £175,000 for your safe return. And he said, we're going to make a tape to your boss. He said, I, I've written out the ransom note, he said, but you're going to speak it. So I've got a tape recorder here. Stephanie has now been kidnapped for three hours. And the horror is about to unfold with her boss, Kevin Watts. The police first heard about Stephanie's disappearance when a phone call was made uh, to Shipways, which was where Stephanie worked to the manager, Kevin Watts. Now, they knew that Stephanie had gone to this house to allow a viewing with a client. There was an indication that there was going to be a letter sent. As Kevin Watts takes in the enormity of what he's just been told, Stephanie is being driven further from their reach. Kevin doesn't know what to do. So he phones his boss and tells him what's happened. And his boss sort of says words to the effect that well, this is bigger than us, Kev. We've got to do something. We've got to tell the police. But you tell them quietly what's happened. Tell them they're not supposed to know, and we'll do all this covertly. Well, within five minutes of his phone call, there were uniformed officers at Turnbury Road and at Shipways. The kidnapper could still be watching the house. He could be watching here. If he sees police everywhere, she's dead. Police now take on board the seriousness of Stephanie's disappearance. All the while, her ordeal deepens. The kidnapper has just pulled in to a quiet lay-by. He turned off the engine and he said something like, Oh, do you want a cup of tea and a ham sandwich? And I thought, what? You're, you've done all this to me. I'm cut and bleeding and bruised and you've injured me. And now you're offering me a bloody picnic. Stephanie's colleagues and police have no idea of her whereabouts. As officers search the property she vanished from, they find some alarming clues. There had been a struggle in the bathroom. There was evidence of a small amount of blood. There was also evidence that they'd gone out through the back French windows, probably into the garage. Stephanie's nowhere to be found. Her vehicle's there. The scenes of a struggle, and uh, it was looking fairly grim at that stage. Police make the difficult decision to inform Stephanie's parents. And when I tell them, there was a, a police sergeant and another girl, and Stephanie's gaffer, Kevin Watts, and I asked straight away, and I said, what's the problem? What's the trouble? And they said, well, Stephanie went to an house this morning and we haven't seen her since she disappeared dinner time. You actually think the worst at the moment. You think, well, what could have happened, say? And there's all different things running through your head. It is now 6 p.m. As Stephanie's parents take in the devastating news, the kidnapper pulls in to their final destination. He said, no screaming, not that anybody's going to hear you out here. He shuffled me across like a gravel driveway and I heard him pull open a very heavy sounding metal door. He led me in, threw on cobblestones, I can remember them being under my feet, and now we're inside the workshop. And he took me through to the back and sat me on a chair and um, tied me with thick rope to the chair. I can remember thinking, this is it, you're going to die in here. Okay. 
Estate agent Stephanie Slater has been kidnapped from an empty property. Blindfold and held at knife point, she has been driven over 70 miles from her hometown in Birmingham. Her colleagues are aware of her disappearance after a terrifying phone call from her attacker. Police have now scrambled to the property to find her blood in the bath. Stephanie has now been missing for over seven hours. In the first instance, it was very, very low key, but we did have a police station that was uh, more or less given to us as the joint inquiry. Uh, you know, I had officers down from West Yorkshire working uh, with the West Midlands officers. Over two hours from home, an exhausted Stephanie has been dragged into a filthy workshop. Her attacker has rendered her defenseless, and Stephanie is becoming more confused by his behavior. He went behind me. He was touching my hair, pulling his hands through it. And you just see in your mind horror stories and horror films over and over again where someone's behind you stroking your hair and then suddenly there's an axe coming down on top of you or something. That's what was going through my mind. Why is he doing that? It was creeping me out. And he said, right, take your clothes off. I've got clothes here for you to wear. And I thought suddenly, no chance. No way, you're not, you're not undressing me, no. You're not taking my modesty as well. And I flatly refused. And started to make him angry. And he said, I'm not having this. Take your clothes off. You're sitting there blindfolded and you can't see anything. And all you can hear is a footstep here or there. And where you hear the footstep, you turn, because you know he's there, or he's there behind you. And suddenly he was here, right next to me. And he said something like, what about Susie Lamplew? And I thought, oh my God. It was like a bolt of ice went through me. Of course I knew the name, of course I knew. She was an estate agent, she was like me. She went missing in 86. I don't know what was behind that remark, but if he was trying to frighten me, he was doing a damn good job. Stephanie has now been missing for over nine hours. An apparent victim of a kidnap attempt, she has limited knowledge of what lies ahead. Just as she is led to believe she's being held for ransom, her ordeal becomes even more horrific. So in the end, when he threatened me again with the knife I undressed, he took my hands via the handcuff chain in between, and with one of his hands he pulled my hands above my head. And with his other hand, he said, right, you're lying back. And he, with his other hand, he pushed it into my chest. And he pushed me back hard onto the mattress. And then he crawled on top of me at an angle. And he proceeded to rape me. And he bit me, you know. That was the worst. It was the biting, my face and my neck, my chest, my shoulders. He really bit me. But I thought, no, you know what, I'm not going to scream. I'm not. I'm not going to shout out. You're not going to get off on this. If you're going to kill me, then so be it. But you're not going to go out in any glory. And then he got off in silence. He wiped me down all over with a damp cloth. And then he gave me men's clothes to wear. And he said, and that won't happen again. Not that it were much. And this changed me, the rape. It changed me completely because I wasn't scared anymore. I wasn't frightened anymore because I felt so dead inside. And as a woman, he's kind of done everything he, he can do to me now to hurt me. There's nothing else. I feel indestructible now because, you know what, I really didn't care anymore. As the threat to Stephanie's life increases, police are unaware they are dealing with a violent rapist. Back in Birmingham, they pull in resources from West Yorkshire, from officers working on a similar case. Their next step is to reach the package sent to Shipways as quickly as possible. The police looked through the sorting office um, that night to try and try and sort of uh, get a little bit of a march on, uh, on the kidnapper. If they could get the letter a little bit earlier, they might be able to have more time to make decisions. Stephanie's attacker has carefully constructed a makeshift coffin inside a bin, indicating this is a man who has calculated his attack. 
He now reminds her of the chilling danger she is facing. I didn't care if I lived or died anymore. I felt nothing. And so when he said to me, I hope you're not claustrophobic, I shrugged my shoulders and I said no. And he said that's good, because you're going in a box, within a box. In Birmingham, police are desperate to uncover the package sent to Stephanie's boss. It could hold vital clues to her whereabouts. Eventually, they uncover it. Within the, that, that first letter were the demands. There was a tape where um, the kidnapper had hurriedly um, recorded Stephanie's voice, obviously to give it authenticity, uh, and some demands in the letter. He found them to say there was a tape in the post at Birmingham, and they grabbed down the sorting office and found this tape, and they brought it back and they played it to Betty and I, just to confirm it was Stephanie. This is Stephanie Slater, the time is 11.45. I can assure you I am okay and unharmed. Providing these instructions are carried out, I will be released on Friday the 31st of January. For next Wednesday you will need an ordnance survey map. As Stephanie's voice rings out to those closest to her, she has no idea if the tape has even been sent. The threat to her life is increasing by the minute, and now the kidnapper inflicts more terror. He said, you've got to get into it like a sleeping bag. So I get halfway down, I can't get any further. It's too narrow, it's too tight. And I told him this, and he said, that's rubbish. He said, you've got to go in there. I got in there early when I tried it out. He said, um, it's easy. Push yourself in, get down, you've got to go in, he said. No two ways about it. Then he told me there were boulders above the bar, above my head, and if I pulled on them, they'd come down and they'd crush me to death. And then my hands were pulled above my head to the left of me, um, and via the handcuff chain, they were attached to a metal bar that went across the top of the box. So I'm in a corkscrewed kind of position, totally twisted. My back was in terrible, terrible agony. And now he's pushing something very sharp up my right trouser leg. He said, can you feel that? And I said, that is really hurting. And he said, good, it's supposed to, those are electrodes. You move around in that box and they'll electrocute you, they'll kill you instantly. Stephanie now lies in grave danger. One slight move will cost her her life. As police try to decipher the ransom note, they call for an immediate media blackout. They can't risk agitating the kidnapper. Another concern is some horrifying similarities in the ransom to a crime West Yorkshire officers are also trying to solve. I mean, we were dealing with the murder of Julie Dart, which we'd linked to an extortion with British Rail, which was in uh, uh, the murder was in July '91 and the extortion in October. We'd received um, a demand letter for um, in the Julie Dart case. The phraseology used in the letters was similar. There were similar misspellings of words in the letters. So we were able to put this sort of circumstantial case together that this could well be the same man. I was always in fear for my life and I thought yes he could get the money and he could kill me. Twenty-five-year-old estate agent Stephanie Slater has been kidnapped and brutally raped at the hands of a vicious attacker. She has now been forced to lie in a makeshift coffin. If she moves, she dies. Meanwhile, police officers have just picked up a ransom demand and chillingly linked her attacker to a murder six months previously. Their next move is crucial, as Stephanie's life hangs in the balance. The kidnapper wanted Kevin Watts to be the courier. There's obviously very high level decisions to make here because if, as we suspected at that time, this man had also committed a murder in the past, we potentially have got a situation where one Stephanie's life was in grave danger and also potentially Kevin Watts. The police have to carefully decide their next move. One wrong decision will end Stephanie's life. Pressure mounts as the hours go by. They have no leads on her whereabouts. Meanwhile, she has only just survived the night. I was going into hypothermia and he said don't pull on the metal bar because of the boulders. 
So as my arms are getting numb, they're getting heavy and I can't feel what they're doing, whether they're pulling on the bar or whatever. And I can still remember to this day, lying in the box and I've got my thumb on my chin like that because I'm trying to hold it up. Then I, I just couldn't feel anything. My whole body went numb and then I was shivering and then I dropped, my body kind of dropped and again I pulled on the bar. But um, the boulder stayed there. But as the night wore on, to be honest with you, I didn't really care if that bar came down. I didn't want to be there for him in the morning. And then I saw a white light in the corner of the box. And I said to myself quite openly, oh right, now you're losing your mind. You're blindfolded in a black box and now you're seeing a light. And inside that light was the face of Christ. As I say, I don't go to church, I'm not religious and I felt quite privileged to have seen this. And I just felt at ease all of a sudden and felt peace. I thought I'd died. I'd simply fallen asleep. As each hour slowly ticks by, Stephanie bears the brunt of the kidnapper's strange behaviour. His mind games are almost too much to bear. He did come back not long after. I honestly think to this day he was really shocked that how close to death I probably looked and how ill and pale I probably was. And he had to half carry me to a chair and he sat me on the chair and he gave me a cup of tea. He must have been watching me. He said, um, you can't move your arms at all. And I said, well, I was frozen in that box last night. And then the tea was abruptly taken away from me. And I thought, oh, damn, I've complained. I've, I've said something. You are treading on eggshells all the time. And then I didn't know where he was. I couldn't sense him. I couldn't hear that footstep or, or any movement. He was down on his hands and knees and he takes my left arm and he rubs it hard. So there you go, is that better? Can you feel that now? Is that better? Is that getting warmer? How about this one? It moves around. That one, how's that arm? As surreal as this was, and oh, it was very strange, I suppose it was at this stage, initially I thought, maybe, just maybe, there's a spark of humanity in him. Maybe there's something worth working on. But police already fear they are now dealing with a man who was killed before, and he could strike again. After the kidnapper's first contact, officers now decide to plant devices should he call again. And there's only me could answer the phone. Every had got to call me and press a button. So, you know, I'd got a card, what to say. When the phone went, Ellie came. Tommy went to Hello? pick the receiver up, and she pressed what button she got to say. Then she'd say, right, speak. It would be important to us as an investigation to have a record of his voice. Also, if he gave any instructions and he spoke to Stephanie's parents, there may not be in, in a, you know, maybe in a state of shock and not remember the detail. And other elements are now firmly in place, as officers, colleagues and family are poised for the kidnapper's next move. I mean, there's many different roles in a, in a kidnap inquiry such as this, uh, and, and, and one of them would be family liaison officers, who would be, in this case, with Stephanie's parents. We never went out of the house till the night she came back, but they made sure we ate, and they kept us occupied. So we have to keep them informed, and also protect them, and also be aware that there might be a phone call comes into their house. Sunday afternoon, five days into the ordeal, the kidnapper surfaces again. Hello, what a sighter. Well, we might be having a sandwich or doing something, and the phone went about two o'clock, picked it up, and it was Ste Stephanie on the phone. But it was a type. I want you to say, hello, this is Stephanie here. Hello, it's Stephanie here. They have allowed me to send a message to you. Just to let you know, I am all right and unharmed. I hear that West Bromwich Albion lost yesterday to Swansea, 3-2. I looked at Ellie and Ellie says, I said, that's Stephanie today. I want you to know I love you. I am not to say too much, but whatever the outcome, I'll always love you. Look after the cats for me. Hello, what a Can I just ask, is she, is she all right?
two phone calls, a tape and a ransom note. The police understand this man is to be taken seriously. There is now increasing pressure placed on Kevin Watts. Officers start to prepare him for what could be the hardest task of his life. He had to be sort of trained to buy time. Ask if he, if he, the voice come, you know, if he gets to the phone box, ask the question twice, try and buy some time. As police gear up for a major operation, Stephanie is constantly being pulled through a psychological nightmare. Her attacker switches between compassion and inflicting panic, reminding her she is at the mercy of a hardened criminal. And I said something and I made him laugh. And after he finished laughing, he said, Oh, I'm going to have to get rid of that now, aren't I? And I said, what's that? Get rid of what? What are you talking about? And he said, over there in the corner, I've got a bin to take your dead body out in. And that kind of scratched the surface. And I could feel all this emotion and this fear and everything. And I reached out for him and I was saying, Bob, where are you? Bob, come on, where are you, Bob? You're not going to kill me, are you? Not, not now, but... And I was sort of, um, but... I couldn't really breathe, I couldn't talk because I was in so much fear and I was, I was crying, the blindfold was soaking wet and I was reaching for him like, like a child would reach for a parent. Tuesday. Stephanie disappeared a week ago, her whereabouts unknown. And all the police have are a number of obscure demands from her kidnapper. Now, he makes contact again. Who's this, please? Never mind. Have you got the money? For tomorrow? For tomorrow? Yeah. Have you got it? I'm getting it, yeah. When the instructions came into Kevin Watts, that was when it was all systems go. As officers make sense of the latest message, Stephanie's disappearance is now taking its toll on those closest to her. Betty had a seizure on the Friday. A seizure, a first one on the Friday to her heart. Uh, I had to face the doctor. But it was the start of the uh, problems that was. Stephanie was away. Stephanie, unaware her mother is in such turmoil, is trying hard to stay positive. So far, she has contained her fear. This man has fed and clothed her for seven days. She hangs on his word that she will be released. Now, she hears noises in the workshop once more, as her kidnapper returns from the phone call to her boss. He brought in a mattress and he also brought, later on, brought in a second mattress. So there are two now. I slept on one and he was to sleep on the other. I've got milk and Kit Kats and, and crisps and things, and I'm putting them down the middle like a barrier, like, stay away from me, don't touch me sort of thing. Later on that evening, he said to me, um, oh, how did he put it? If I, if I was to ask you to do what happened on the first night, what would you say? He was referring to the rape. And I said, I'd ask you not to ask that of me, because I don't want to. And he said, that's all right, I just thought I'd ask. Through those eight days, somehow, I've managed to get some respect from him. From him! It was a tremendous hurdle to get over, but I'd done it. Each day for Stephanie has been an emotional roller coaster. Her attacker, on the other hand, has made her ordeal part of his daily routine. It seems totally incredible to me now that I was at the back of the workshop in the coffin and in the box, and he opens up his workshop to members of the public. I can hear him using a till, I can hear him on the phone, chatting to people, laughing with people and having a joke. And I'm at the back, all chained up and locked away, imprisoned. Her captor runs a small tool repairing shop just yards away. Each day he opens up to regular customers. His wife even drops by with his lunch. I think, OK, do I scream? Is that what I'm supposed to do? Do I shout for help? But what if he hears me and they don't? He was a man of very few words, but
but he liked to talk to me you know when we sat down and had soup and that it was weird it was surreal because I knew in the back of my head that my life was on the line here and one wrong move and that's it but the times that he would give me something to eat or drink or you know, would pay me a compliment he even took my photograph once it was so strange you know it's like the table's really turning but it it was because I was compliant. It was because I didn't give him any reason to harm me. Meanwhile, the pressure is mounting on Stephanie's employer. Kevin Watts has the horrifying responsibility of meeting the kidnappers' demands. The whole operation lies on his shoulders. Neither he nor Stephanie may come out of this alive. He was happy to do this. I, I, I don't know whether he realised until afterwards that the, the potential, but I know from speaking with him and his wife afterwards, um, you know, there were a few tears shed that morning when he knew when he left home that, uh, you know, it depended on him possibly whether Stephanie came back alive. As Stephanie anxiously waits to see how the day unfolds, her attacker is leading her boss and the police through his carefully constructed game plan. His first one was at Glossop Railway Station where he was told to go to the kiosk inside the entrance of the railway station and he would receive a phone call. Um, he got there, um, he then received a message to go to another kiosk and he's got his instructions to go to a telephone box in an area called Four Lane Ends, which is uh, in, in the Sheffield area. As Kevin follows his instructions and heads over the Pennines, he travels deeper into the unknown. The kidnapper wants to shake the police should they be involved. And so far, it's working. That night, the fog came down. This really up the ante. That meant Kevin Watts was now behind schedule. He'd been given times when he had to be at the next phone box because the phone would ring. He got to four lanes ends, it was late. He's panicking a little bit by this stage. He gets his instructions which is then to go down this, this lane nearby. And as he gets to the entrance to the lane, he sees a sign, Shipways, uh, directing him which way to go. The pressure is now immense. Kevin is behind schedule, no clue of his whereabouts, and alone with the kidnapper's ransom. The attacker could pounce at any moment. He's now isolated. He's in a strange place, down a narrow lane, feeling highly vulnerable. He gets halfway down the lane, and there's a big cone in the middle of the lane. It tells him is to swap the money from one bag to another. The kidnapper now lies in wait as Kevin follows his final instructions. He lays the money on a wall, unaware there is a 60-foot drop right on the other side. As soon as Kevin is out of earshot, the attacker pounces for his ransom. Sam's is 60 feet below the bridge. Attached to the wooden tray is a fishing line. The tray stood on its sand. Sam's yanks on the fishing line and down tumbles the mummy. He's actually, he's on his moped. He's travelled there, he's had his moped in the back of his car. Um, he puts the money into the back of the pannier and off he rides. Meanwhile, over 50 miles away in Newark, Stephanie now thinks she has been left to die. That was one hell of a long day. You're talking from 8 o'clock in the morning until half past 11 at night. That's how long I was in there. And you can imagine the panic I was in when he said, I'll be back at 9.30, and he wasn't. 
because then you think he's got the money and he's gone. The kidnapper has successfully fled with £175,000 and the police have no trace on him. Kevin has made the drop but he has no idea if the attacker now has the money or if Stephanie is dead or alive. I thought he'd abandoned me and he'd gone. I tried to commit suicide that night by suffocation because I was so frightened. I just put the blankets that he'd given me in the box in my mouth and over my face and pushed my face into the side of the box. The money's gone. We haven't got a prisoner and we haven't got Stephanie. You know, everybody was absolutely gutted. In the distance, Stephanie hears a faint noise. Although behind schedule, her kidnapper has returned. I shouted at him, is that you? Where have you been? Have you got the money? Please, God, get me out of here. After a few minutes of that, he actually came over to the box and opened it and got me out and I collapsed into his arms. I've never been so weak in all my life, or so frightened. Remarkably, Stephanie's attacker, true to his word, prepares her for the journey home. All the while, police, colleagues and family have no idea she's about to return. He said, I've decided that I'm going to take you home. Because, he said, because I don't want anything bad to happen to you. He said, I was going to give you a knife and put you in a phone box so you could call the police. The knife to protect yourself if anybody came at you. He said, to, so to make sure that you get home safe, I'm taking you home. Eight days after her disappearance, Stephanie Slater arrives on her doorstep, alone. I was ringing the bell, knocking the knocker. The door wasn't answered for ages. The door started to bang, you see. He said, leave it, leave it. Then he come down, open the door, so. And then, when it was opened, there was a young blonde man stood there on the threshold of the door, looking down at me. He was Mum and Dad's liaison officer, he didn't recognise me. And there she was standing in front of me. And he reached over him and he grabbed hold of my um, top of my coat and pulled me up into the porch. Stephanie, through her own wit and instinct, uh, saved her own life and, uh, you know, uh, highly admirable is that. As Stephanie and her family face the country's media glare and take in the enormity of her ordeal, police launch a nationwide hunt to find her kidnapper. A man they believe has also killed 18-year-old Julie Dart and attempted to defraud British Rail, Michael Sams. We got the information from Stephanie, what she'd remembered. We'd got information from witnesses. We'd got an artist's impression. We'd got witnesses who said he was when they saw him at the house. So all these pieces were put together. Three weeks after Stephanie's abduction, police appeal for her kidnapper on BBC's Crime Watch. In a few minutes, you'll hear the voice of the man who kidnapped Stephanie Slater. You want to do it? If you a password, if you tell me a word, I'll get her to repeat it to say that she's all right. Yes. Could I have her mother and father's Christian names, please? A lady called Susan Oakes, and, and interest in this, she'd been following some of the information that had come out, and they'd started to develop this idea that it might be her ex-husband, Michael Sams. I dispatched the team off. He wasn't in, his wife Tina was there, so they wouldn't be back till five o'clock there. So no, it's not, it's not urgent. We watched Crime Watch last night. He said that he might be getting a visit. That I had a nervy ten minute drive then from Sutton in Trent to the Swan and Salmon Yard, where Sam's workshop was. And when they walked through the door, they knew, you know, that, that this was gold. Mr. Sam's questions to ask you about Stephanie Slater. Everything that Stephanie had said about this place, 
she'd heard the ring, of, you know, the sound of a, a dial on the old telephone, the ping of a microwave, almost immediately confessed to the kidnapping of uh, Stephanie. Michael Sams was given four life sentences in 1993. He was found guilty of blackmailing British Rail, murdering Julie Dart, and Stephanie's kidnap and imprisonment. Sams is a very sad individual. Um, he's dyslexic. Um, that was his, part of his downfall and the spelling mistakes in, in his letters, which, which helped us track him down. He's a, he's a very bright man, very arrogant, very self-centred. He can't face up to his mistakes. For years, 50-year-old Sams had been a hard-working husband and father. His brush previously with crime had been for car theft. An illness led to Sams losing a leg, and some said his attitude changed. Indeed, his split personality was a major part of his game plan. He also um, tried to frighten me with talk that he had a mate who was in this with him, but his mate apparently was a nasty piece of work and it was a good job that he wasn't looking after me. It was the other man who wanted to kill Stephanie. It was the other man who'd murdered Julie Dart. And it was the other man who had actually tried to uh, extort £200,000 out of British Air with this brilliant idea that the other man had stolen off him. The other man is an illusion created by Sam's. Stephanie has moved on with her life and fought hard to get over her ordeal. Her mental strength and resilience is testament to how she survived those horrifying eight days. Her continued courage and determination not to be beaten is an inspiration. Everything changed from the day uh, she went missing. Why he did rape her? Well, Stad did stick in me claw. You know, of course, there was no need to. I complied with him all the time. So I ain't got a lot of compassion for him at all. I couldn't care less what happened to him, really. You know, that's it. He, he can rot. He can rot. Yes, he was calculating. Yes, he did plan it to a certain extent. But he was no master criminal. Um, at the end of it, he was just lucky. You can analyse him until the cows come home, but it doesn't matter, does it? You know, he doesn't matter. In this world, he doesn't matter. <laughs>